Today there was free candy and free pumpkin. Ooh, good morning. We're already midway through November and I haven't posted much. November is traditionally a time when you try to do a lot of writing. Uh, if you participate in like NaNoWriMo, uh, then you're trying to write a novel in a month. Uh, I've been trying to do AstroRimo, where I'm trying to write every single day and get as much content as I can, astronomically speaking. So last week I finished a big grant proposal, which went to the National Science Foundation. Uh, I'll talk about that more maybe in my next video when I talk about my latest paper. Last week I did something really fun, which was I did an Instagram live chat. And I've never used Instagram's live feature, so it was really cool to get to try that out, to set up a, a ladder and like strap my phone to it and plug it in. Uh, so that I could have like a steady shot. So Jonathan Wax, uh, who runs the Instagram account, Space Facts Wax, he reached out to me online and asked if I would be interested in doing a, a live chat about Kepler and about being an astronomer and my background. Um, and it was really fun. We had lots of people watch it. So he sent me the screen capture of that video. So I'll include a few clips of that here. Without further ado, here's my chat with uh, Space Facts Wax. That rig you put together for your phone is amazing. I'm going to let you tell people who you are and, and we'll go from there. Okay, uh, my name's uh, James Davenport. Uh, I am an astronomer in Seattle. Uh, so I have a PhD in astronomy from the University of Washington. So just, yeah, okay, to get a little more detail. So I, ha I did five years in college uh, just because I took my time uh, and, and was really bad at like math. <laughs> <laughs> Had to redo some math classes. Um, and then uh, I did a master's for two years, which is a little unusual in astronomy uh, in the U.S. Usually you just go straight to PhD, but uh, those math class, that, that GPA wasn't so high. And so uh, I did a standalone master's to kind of figure out if I was serious about this uh, life as a scientist thing. Uh, and then I went and did six years uh, for a PhD. Um, and I graduated. I got that about uh, three or four years ago. Uh, so, so I've had my PhD now for almost four years. Awesome. I mean, I guess how important is the math? I mean, is it something that's super crucial to what you do? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. it's it's definitely important, right? Like, I, I have a lot of fond memories. I, I had a really lucky experience with a math teacher in high school who, like, it really clicked with, right? And one of the themes you hear when you talk to scientists or academics or historians or whatever is, like, uh, I had this one teacher, and they, like, blew my mind, and it just, and, like, that made the difference, right? Yeah. And, like, the, the role of mentors and, um, and, and inspiration is like super, super critical. And, and for me, I had a math teacher. Uh, I was lucky enough to have him. I, I, went, I grew up in a small town, uh, like 400 people in my high school. So Where you up? Uh, I grew up, I went to a high school called Natchez Valley High School, go Rangers. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's about three hours east of Seattle, uh, yeah. kind of in the, in the foothills of Mount Rainier. Uh, and it's just, it's like a rural agricultural community. And like two of us from that uh, high school class went to the University of Washington. Right. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, it was a small town. I was so lucky to have one great math teacher who was able to teach calculus uh, and say the things in a way that like stuck in my brain. You know what I mean? Right. Like that was the, that was the key. Um, there was, I mean, I didn't, there was no physics. There was no astronomy. There was like very basic science in my high school. I was just like a nerd who went to space camp and like watch Star Trek, but I got enough educational footing that I was able to actually get into university. So I was very lucky in that way. Sure. And so now you're on a path where you're doing all this research and specifically you've been working a lot with Kepler, right? So That's when did right. that start? Uh, when did you start digging into Kepler? Yeah, so um, Kepler mission launched in 2009. Yeah, so it launched right after I started my PhD and, and like in the first like six months of my PhD, a friend of mine came back to, uh, to UW and gave a, a talk, a seminar, saying, like, check out the hot new data off this new telescope, which I had barely heard of. I was working through other stuff. I was a young student. And uh, she came back. Uh, this is Lucianne Walkwitz. She came back and gave uh, an amazing talk, uh, just saying, like, look, Kepler, it, it lives. It's in space, and it's doing cool stuff. And it was just like a show and tell. And I was just like, sign me up. Oh, my God. And And... I was like, I got, I got to be involved in that. I got to join that on some level. And, and so I kind of like dipped my toe in. Uh, I still was working for my PhD. Uh, hey, greetings from Brazil. What's up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like checking out the messages as they come by. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so like in the middle of my PhD, I, I still was sort of progressing on sort of project. That's where me and my advisor thought we were going. And, uh, and then I just found myself spending all my time working on Kepler. Like 
it was like the side thing that just consumed me. And I was like, nobody cares about this other stuff I'm doing. I got to work on Kepler. It's just so hot. And it was blowing up in the news. And so halfway through my PhD, I dropped my thesis project entirely uh, because I realized that it, it wasn't hot. It wasn't happening. I wasn't excited about it and no one else was either. And so I said, I got to go for it. I have to, I have to just follow my nose because being an astronomer, being a scientist and academic, it's a life full of like failures and challenges. It's a hard gig. Um, you're always hustling. You're always you work, you've been working something for years and never see results from it, right? I mean, it's, it's, that's right. That's right. Yes, you can't make nature do what you want. You can't yeah. make the math do what you want. Computers are fast, but not infinitely fast. You know, like there's just challenges all the time. It's a you know, if you're good at it, it's hard. Right. <laughs> Even if you're good at it, if you're not, then good luck. <laughs> If it's not hard, you're probably not doing something right. Right. So, um, so I, I, you know, I was like, I got, I got to go where my heart is. I have to go and work with Kepler data because I'm way more stoked about this, uh, knowing that a ton of other people were also excited about it. And so, uh, it'd be okay to be second at something as long as I cared about what I was doing. Is what I decided. Sure. Yeah. It's just the Elon Musk, you know, <laughs> wanted to get to Mars. You know, it's 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 basically making a, a duplicate hard drive of Earth on on another planet. You know, the fact that we're all here on this, this one, you know, place where, it, you know, anything can happen, you know, and, and it's kind of like expanding humanity before it's too late. That, yeah. that to me is why I feel like the, the continued funding of NASA, or, you know, and, and all of their affiliate SpaceX and, you know, is so, is so crucial just to expand, you know, humanity and getting <laughs> past you know, here. Human, human space flight is super critical to yeah. part of this. And a lot of like, pure scientists are like, ah, human space flight, just send telescopes. They're more interesting. But like, I grew up like loving human space flight too, like a huge Apollo nerd and moon mission nerd. Like I went to space camp on my own dime after working at a burger <laughs> shop for a, for a summer as a 16 year old. Like, um, like it was like, it's important and it resonates with the soul and that that's not to be ignored, right? The inspiration benefit is like humongous. Yeah. So let's turn this around. I am all about like mission to Mars, mission to the moon. I, I applied to the astronaut corps during the last call last uh, year ago. I was not selected, uh, but I'll apply again. Keep doing but, it. But let us remember that until we make rockets cheap and like the USS Enterprise a reality, like we're stuck here, <laughs> you know? So like there's a whole bunch of science that it's important that we make sure we don't mess this earth up yep. and, and life up here. Like I'm all about, and okay, and like Elon Musk knows this and he's also working on stuff here too. But like, you know, like it's important to remember, like we got to be driven by both what's out there and what's right here too. Some more fun questions, I guess. You know, uh, you know, favorite science fiction or, or, not, or no, not science fiction or science non, you know, nonfiction, uh, book, movie, uh, podcast? Yeah, okay. Book, uh, my favorite, like the... Hmm. The sci-fi book that got me excited about reading again, it's okay, it's not the greatest book in the world, but it got me excited about reading again was Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Heinlein. Uh, it's, you know, like 1960s style sci-fi. Mm, some aspects of Heinlein and that kind of, that era of sci-fi don't hold up super well, like in the, uh, in our progressive present, but uh, it's a great bit of sci-fi. I really like that. Uh, that's my best, my favorite book. I really liked The Martian, but I really liked The Martian on audiobook. Uh, the performance that, like, whatever you can get on Amazon, I got it on yeah. CD. Uh, that performance is, like, I think it's better than the movie, and I think it's yeah. better than the book. So, that, I don't know, that audiobook kicked total butt. Go, go buy that. That was I'm awesome. a huge Audible person, by the way. I have all my books I listen to on Audible. I, yeah. I go, go listen to the, the Martian on Audible or whatever. Like, it, right. was, it was top notch. I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and then my favorite sci-fi movie, oh, that's hard. I got a bunch of, like, DVDs, uh, but I got to give the love to Apollo 13. Apollo 13, I went and saw Apollo 13 when I was, like, in the fourth grade or whatever, or fifth grade with my dad. And it was like, you know, they said a few more bad words and whatever. It was a little more exciting than I was normally used to seeing it. But, like, it was one of those, like, oh, this is amazing as, like, a little kid, you know, having my mind blown uh, as a little kid. And Apollo 13 is still, like, that's the movie. Like, yeah, if and I the have soundtrack to that film and the, the, the composer, it's just, you know, everything about it, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's uplifting. It's a great story. I was actually just watching something with Ron Howard who he was talking about it. Uh, and he was saying, you know, this, this, when he was doing like the, uh, showing it in previews, I guess, and one right. of the 
one of the uh, feedbacks from, from one of the viewers was like, this movie sucks because there's no way this could have happened. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible. Yeah. It's yeah. like, <laughs> no. It like, I mean, literally it, happened, dude. It, it <laughs> happened. It was the first I didn't know it was a true story. <laughs> yeah. I love, okay, what I love about Paul 13 too as like a movie nerd is um, they did the zero gravity shots for real. It's the only movie. With the plane they, or when they dropped it? That's yeah, they, did, they did the vomit comet, right, where it does the parabolic flights, and you That's get like crazy. 30 seconds of zero G. They yeah. built an Apollo command and landing module inside of the vomit comet, the KC-135 vomit comet, uh, and they sit there and did this I for no days. Idea. So I all know. the zero G shots in Apollo 13 are the real deal. Tom Hanks, OP Tom Hanks right there. So uh, absolutely. did that too? He went up in that plane and he did that? All, all the actors, when they're, well, like, when they're, that first scene where they, like, get into zero G and they're, like, opening their gloves and they're laughing is just, like, straight out of camera. Like, they were just, like, having fun during that first take or whatever. It's amazing. They, they must they, have gotten sick, though, too, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, they call it the vomit comet for a reason, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that, that to me, like, you're never going to beat that. No CG. Yeah. I mean, there's CG in the movie, but like the, all those zero G scenes, all that enthusiasm, like puffiness in their eyes as they're floating around, their hair like wafting, all those tiny things. Yeah, uh, awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, is there anything you want to leave us with? With 25 seconds left to go. 25 seconds left. Uh, science is something for everybody. It belongs to everybody. So go look up and look down and be curious because you can understand the world around you. That's what science is. Yeah, love it. Well, thank you so much for this.